Is building gnarly grip strength simply just as easy as making your forearms bigger? Well, it turns out that there's a lot more that may be at play when it comes to training for grip strength and grappling. Muscles and tendons are two different types of tissue in the body, and it pays to know how they each adapt so that we can optimize our training. Now, this video is gonna be a tad bit different than my past videos, because I'll be doing it in more of a lecture format with slides to help keep me on track. We'll first look at the basic differences between muscles and tendons, and next we'll look at the different ways that muscles and tendons adapt to training. And lastly, we'll look at two different case studies and talk about how they might structure their training based off of their specific goals in order to improve your grip strength for grappling while staying healthy. All right, welcome to the Grip Strength for the Grappling Lecture. Uh, this is about the difference between muscles and tendons, as promised in the intro. So I am Patrick Jacobs, obviously. I am a licensed, very important, licensed physical therapist. I see patients daily. Uh, and I also have a doctor of physical therapy, very fancy. I also have a doctor of brolosophy, like you may have seen from my shin conditioning video, which I hold in more esteem. It's very lonely in here talking to my camera, so please bear with me. I'm used to talking to my colleagues if I give a lecture or to different physical therapy students. Uh, so again, I apologize if it gets a little awkward in here, but I think we'll, I think we'll uh, fight through it. Okay, muscles, contractile. This means that they receive an innervation uh, or a signal from the nerve, and they shorten. As a motor unit, that's really all that means. Signal comes down to the muscle, the muscle contracts, it moves the tendon, and the bone moves. Pretty simple. Highly vascularized. Got a pretty good blood supply, which means it heals faster uh, and it adapts faster than tendons do. Uh, it's more elastic than a tendon. Pretty self-explanatory. It gets longer and shortens a little bit better than tendons do. Tendons shorten and lengthen a little bit, uh, although not that much. Uh, it's comprised of proteins like myosin and myoglobin. Uh, there are many more proteins. Uh, if you want to go look them up, you can. That is not the point of this video. Uh, this is mainly to say that the chemical makeup kind of dictates their function. Okay? And those, those are different proteins than later we'll see in the tendon. Uh, it's located between two tendons. So you have a bone, tendon, muscle, tendon, bone. And depending on the alignment of the body at the time and what you tell the muscle to do depends on which bone will move. Okay, Pretty simple there too. All right, tendons, non-contractile. So the muscle contracts the tendon distributes the force from the muscle to the bone, and then the bone moves, okay? Less vascularized, pretty self-explanatory. Doesn't have as good of a blood flow, therefore it adapts less, or excuse me, takes more time to adapt, uh, and it also takes more time to heal if it is truly a tendinopathic injury or a, a pain in the tendon. It's stiffer than muscle, so it's what we call viscoelastic. Viscoelastic means that it has, it behaves mechanically like an elastic material and like a liquid. For example, let's say, I don't know, my desk is a pool of water and I stand up by the ceiling and I jump off and I do a belly flop. Boom, I hit and the muscles or the molecules of the water stay really close together. So I don't go anywhere and then I start to slowly float and I am writhing in agonizing pain because I just did a really good belly flop although the people drunk at the pool are very happy that I did that, okay? Now if I take my hand and I just, much more boring, but I put it through the plane of the top of the water, it allows for my hand to sink deeper and deeper much more quickly. And that is because the molecules of the water, due to the force of the load, are allowed to move. So this is what we mean by viscoelastic. It is based off of tendons and their molecular structure adapt based off of the rate of force that's put through them. We'll talk about this a little later. Okay, now it's comprised of collagen type one. So mainly, obviously again, much like muscle, there are other things that are uh, involved in the chemical makeup of a tendon, uh, but it's mainly type one collagen uh, and that allows, or that's mainly the reason for its stiffness or uh, the nature of it being stiff. And then it connects muscle to bone. So the muscle pulls on the tendon, and then the tendon pulls on the bone, like we talked about earlier. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about the differences in the training adaptations. Uh, we're gonna split muscle into two groups. Again, muscle hypertrophy and strength. And then we'll talk about tendon stiffness and tendon elasticity. So first is muscle hypertrophy, which just means getting swole as fuck, basically. Uh, you stay within the five to 30 rep range and you have about a 30 to 80, the literature would suggest between 30 and 85% intensity of your one rep max. 
<laughs> you should, you're pretty safe if you stay within that range. You can manipulate the variables uh, to, to manage your stimulus to fatigue ratio uh, and your minimum effective volume and all those things. If you want to know a little bit more about muscle hypertrophy, there is a very sexy Jewish bald man by the name of Dr. Mike Isratel over at Renaissance Periodization. I have a huge man crush on him. If he sees this, on the off chance he sees this, uh, I love you. And I'm not being facetious at all. Uh, kind of, but maybe. Go look at their page. It is very educational, and he is super entertaining as well, okay? So, the literature also suggests that the eccentric portion of the movement, so if we're talking about grip strength like we are in this video, we would take like maybe a dumbbell and we would curl it up r really slowly, that's concentric, and then we would really slow eccentric and focus on that deep stretch at the bottom and then come back up. That would make our forearms get really big. All right, and then the accumulation of volume. So you would add more reps and sets rather than increasing the load, maybe, uh, whenever it comes to wanting to get bigger or muscle hypertrophy. Now there is some overlap. Okay, let's move on to the next one, strength. There is overlap between strength and hypertrophy, particularly if you're not trained. So if you're new to the weight room, you're gonna get strong and you're gonna get big and it's gonna be quicker than you ever thought possible. Uh, even without steroids, but even quicker with steroids, but we're not going to talk about steroids right now. Uh, and you can see the difference in the two. So in my previous slide, you see Arnold, huge, right? One of the best bodybuilders ever. Uh, and then you see here Lu Xiaozun. He's a Chinese weightlifter uh, for the Chinese Olympic weightlifting team. He, all, he has the world record in the 77 kilo weight class for clean and jerk snatch, and I think the total as well. So... <laughs> um, Arnold is much bigger than Lu Xiaozun, but Lu Xiaozun is much stronger. Arnold is also not weak, and Lu Xiaozun is not small. So we can see as you manipulate the variables or as you get a little bit more trained in your specific uh, sport that the Venn diagram starts to pull apart and less overlap becomes um, available. So roughly, oh shit, three to six rep range. Uh, you're going to stay uh, in that rep range and you're also going to stay a little bit closer to your one rep max instead of trying to approximate failure uh, like we would in hypertrophy. And then you focus on a load increase so you want the weights to get bigger and bigger since we define uh, strength as the ability to produce load or produce force through a certain joint, uh, increasing that over time will increase your neural adaptation, so on and so forth. Okay. So now we're talking about tendons. And if you want a stiffer tendon, uh, which is consequently better for performance, which we'll talk about here in a second, we're gonna do more plyometric or power movements, like jumping, like cleaning jerks, uh, sprinting, things like that. Uh, you need to look no further than uh, track athletes. They're very fast and they're very powerful, very explosive. This is because their tendons are very stiff. And this is because of it, a lot, the way that they are moving allows for cross-link formation. I think I wrote about, yeah, lysol oxidase and sugars, those are the, the, the chemicals that actually allow, or that are actually cross-linking, but that's not what's important here. Remember we talked about the belly flop, that quick force distribution for the water, the molecules didn't have a chance to move very quickly because of its viscoelastic nature. Same thing with the tendon. If we're putting a lot of pressure or a lot of force through these collagen fibers, the cross links form because every time you try to put force to, through it, it doesn't actually allow for them to move, right? So every time we sprint, every time we jump, more cross links are being formed and the stiffer the tendon gets. Now, this is good for performance. However, how many times have you seen somebody sprinting uh, in, at a high level and injure their hamstring? Your tendons can become stiffer than your muscles are strong. So there is a balance to be reached here. Now we won't get too much into the, the injured portion. Again, I need to say this, this is all healthy tissue, okay? When it comes to injured tissue, it's a completely different story for how you would load and program certain things. This is for if you want your grip strength to get better. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that because you will have keyboard warriors saying that. All right, now for tendon elasticity, which tends to be better for health. So we're talking mainly about the portion of the tendon that is closer to the muscle or the musculotendinous junction. 
whenever we're doing a very good squat, like it's like it's on the uh, uh, on the screen here, the musculotendinous junction of let's say the Achilles tendon is, and we're moving very slow and we're moving in a very controlled manner, much like taking my hand and putting it through the plane of the water, the molecules are allowed to move back and forth along one another. And the, it minimizes cross-link formation so the tendon does not get as stiff, which is a pretty good thing, especially for the musculotendinous junction because its job, it, if you were to ask an engineer to take something elastic and connect it to something that's non-elastic, they would have a cow because it's very hard to do mechanically. Well, our bodies are constantly adapting to try and do that for us. So where the muscle meets the tendon, we want it to be a little bit elastic because it's attaching something elastic to something inelastic, like a bone. So at the bone, we want it to be stiff. And then at the muscle end, we want it to be elastic. Again, there's a balance to be made. I think we should, the literature or common principles seem to suggest, or the people who talk about the most seem to suggest that whenever you're in the off season, you focus on tendon health. And then whenever you ramp up to your uh, athletic event, then you try to get your tendon more stiff if explosiveness is what you want, which it is what you want if you're a combat athlete. <laughs> You'd be hard pressed to try to convince me that combat athletes do not need to be strong and powerful. Uh, and this lecture is about improving your grip strength specifically for judo, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, all the grappling sports, okay? So again, minimizes cross-link formation and is better for health and longevity. So here I'm thinking about maybe the older guy, probably in his 40s, who gets the bug. He's been listening to a Jocko podcast or whatever, and he's like, I want to do jiu-jitsu. And he comes in, and he doesn't know where to start. Okay, that's, I would... I would say from a resistance training perspective, moving slow and controlled with wrist curls or just really working on a nice pulling movement uh, is probably gonna be better for the tendon health because we want you to do better for the long term and start to learn that new skill of jujitsu or judo or wrestling and be healthy while doing it rather than trying to focus on performance at that age, okay? Exercise examples for each of these. So. I postulate that it's better to train for tendon stiffness if you want better performance for your grip strength in the gym, or excuse me, in uh, for jiu-jitsu, wrestling, or uh, what am I forgetting, judo. So uh, especially for younger folks who are trying to compete and get better at on a national, a state, a national, or world level, I think your tendons need to be very stiff and be able to distribute force quickly and minimize that cross-link formation, or excuse me, um, promote that cross-link formation so that they get stiff. However, we don't want it to get too stiff uh, because jujitsu jiu players or, or wrestlers notoriously have uh, muscle issues because their tendons are stronger than they are, than their muscles are strong, or tendons are stiffer than their muscles are strong. So something like a hanging dynamic grip change, and those, these will be up on the screen. So you're hanging and you're actually moving down, you're changing your grips really quickly. It's having to combat the weight of your, your body uh, and it's constantly changing, but you're having to produce a lot of force at once. Okay, maybe doing these like 30 seconds, taking a 30 second break and then doing it again. Not too taxing for your forearms, uh, but really good stimulus for tendon stiffness. Okay, the push up to the finger hold. Again, this is gonna be on the screen, but you, you explode up and then boom, you catch your body on your fingertips and then handstand walks or, or handstand holds uh, because your tendons are maximally elongated in that position and, in, and anybody who's ever worked on handstands will tell you that the control of the handstands actually comes from the pressure on the ground from your fingertips. The fingertips are, are the muscles that control the wrist and the fingertips are essentially your, your muscles that are heavily involved in grip, okay? And then for tendon elasticity, uh, really any wrist curl variation, uh, we'll use myself as an example. Um, I was actually able to double my grip strength in like 12 weeks. Uh, and I made a video about it. I'll, I'll put the link in the description. Uh, but I will caveat it. I had a forearm injury when I was younger playing football. And I have some hardware in my arm made it hard. And after I did physical therapy, uh, I never really called up my grip strength in my right hand. Uh, so I had a lot of neuromuscular and neural gains to make. And my tendons also 
in, in the first four weeks, I started doing hypertrophy training. So anything like we're about to talk here, wrist curl variations, really slow and controlled. Did some slow rice bucket movement. So you stick your hands in the rice bucket and you move very slowly up and down. So those collagen uh, fibers minimize cross-link formation and they're actually able to uh, be, stay more elastic, particularly at the muscular tendinous junction. Uh, but then the last eight weeks, I focused on the tendon stiffness. So I was doing more rock climbing holds, I was doing more uh, like rag pull-ups or um, inverted rows to mimic like holding a gi, things like that. Uh, go check that out if you want. So I actually have a PDF of the actual program that I have. Uh, and if you just send me a DM or, or an email, I can kind of walk you through how I set that up. But yeah, these are some exercise examples uh, of what we would use for your grip strength. And let's get into some cases because this is really, really what I want you to kind of get at here. All right, first case, 23 year old, new to jujitsu and weightlifting. So has the fountain of youth on his side. He's new to jujitsu. Uh, and he hasn't lifted weights before. So first off, he's about to get an absolute mental fucking smashing uh, because everybody knows your first couple of days in jiu-jitsu, probably your first couple of months in jiu-jitsu even if you don't have any athletic background are going to be absolute hell. Uh, but if he sticks through it and he actually starts lifting, uh, he'll see some pretty good gains. And in this case, I know this is about grip strength, but there's really no need to be picky about exercise selection when it comes to your grips, I would do risk, I would add a wrist curl variation at the beginning of the training. Cause the reason we do this in the beginning of the training is because tendons adapt well in about a five to 10 minute period. Uh, and then the markers that your tendons release for them to adapt in a certain way actually start to taper off after five to 10 minutes. And they don't start to, and, and they don't reliably turn back on with a stimulus until about six hours later. So, we want to place all these exercises, grip related, in the beginning of your program for something like this. So I would say for him, I would do just your typical hypertrophy. Uh, you know, we do wrist curls either in front or behind, uh, and then we might do some really slow rice buckets, get a little burn in the forearm, uh, but we're really trying to focus on a little bit of tendon health because he's probably gonna be gripping really hard, especially during his first couple of months in jujitsu. So we just wanna make sure that he stays injury free there. Now, compound movements and full range of motion are gonna make him very strong and get bigger pretty quickly. Uh, definitely gonna limit him to one, once to two times a week. I know this is probably gonna ruffle some feathers, uh, but in order for him to do something sustainable and be consistent with it, which is the next one, I would rather him lift weights for more days than he actually did jujitsu because that's going to be better for him from a injury standpoint. And even though he may not accumulate many sessions in the, in the beginning, he will do better in the long run. And I, I don't know that that's necessarily something that's arguable. <laughs> um, you want it to be consistency. Everybody knows that consistency on the mats is better than short spurts, time off, short spurts, time off injury. Uh, and then, you know, we focus on the muscle and the muscle and tendon health because he's doing very slow movements and giving his tendon stimulus that they haven't necessarily gotten before. So that's kind of how we would structure it. Uh, get him in the weight room. First five to 10 minutes would be focused on grip strength and then finish off your exercises uh, and then get crushed on the mats for a couple months. Okay. Case number two, we got a 27 year old. He's been wrestling for 15 years and five years of doing BJJ. He wants to focus on grip strength specifically. He trains BJJ three times a week and lifts twice a week and he's been lifting for about three years. So he's on the later end of novice, uh, but probably maybe an intermediate if he lifted when he was younger and then just kind of took a break or whatever. Uh, but the first thing I want to note here is he's probably got really good tendon development from wrestling at a young age. We know, um, or we can be reasonably certain the consensus is, is pretty clear that you, you start laying down collagen uh, in, your, in your tendons for the first 18 years, 17 to 18 years of your life. And then after that, the new collagen stops being laid down. So the collagen or the tendons that you have to work with is pretty much set for you at 17 or 18 years old. Now, if you start wrestling or start rock climbing at a young age, your tendons are going to be very big and well-developed 
from having done that at a young age up until 18. So he's already got a really good foundation here for tendon health. Uh, this is going to focus on tendon stiffness for performance. Uh, this, since he wants to be able to in improve his performance and we know that we want to minimize cross-link formation, there is going to be a certain part of his program that includes some of the exercises we talked about before uh, that really put a, a lot of strain and force distribution through powerful force distribution through his fingers uh, in different ways that mimic grappling and the way that we have to dynamically change our grips and throw and things like that. Those are going to be again at the beginning of his program. So we might start off with those push-ups to the fingers uh, and then we might switch to you know if you've got the pull-up bars that are stacked you might pull yourself up, catch the pull-up bar, catch the pull-up bar, back down or back to the rope. Um, any, any sort of variation of those that puts a ton of force distribution through the tendons of your fingers and your hands. Uh, and that's going to be the first five to ten minutes and then you go on with your lifting session after that. We're also going to need to minimize, how do I say this without pissing people off because the combat sport culture is very against this it seems like uh, the more that I learn about it. You're going to need to start managing your volume on the mats. If you want to target your training to something specific, it, and this is true for any sport, you have to either put the rest of your activities on maintenance volume or don't, don't take them out completely, just minimize their volume. For example, if you're used to going hard every single, every single time you train for three days a week and you've been able to do that because this guy's of five years of BJJ and 15 years of wrestling, he's probably, he's probably a blue belt or definitely a blue belt, probably a purple belt by now. And he can probably just do what he wants to with everybody. When you start adding something, adding more to your central nervous system, like really quick, powerful movements do, you have to manage your volume elsewhere. And so I would actually have him do light rolling days, positional work, working on things that are weak for his game, uh, and, and really just kind of focusing on technique rather than going balls to the wall. And then um, placed after a rest day, one hard rolling day so that you, so that you still maintain the cardio that you need. Uh, for for uh, something like a competition. Um, and again, the, the grip strength specific exercise is going to be at the beginning of lifting days so you can uh, harness the full power of your central nervous system and the neural drive that you have. Okay, So those are the two cases that I've got. Um, if you have any questions, this is, <laughs> this is by no means a, an exhaustive list or meant to be something that's super in-depth. Uh, I certainly skipped over a lot. I kind of wish there were some things that I had said, uh, but I want to know what you guys think about this format. Uh, it's a little bit more informal. It also requires me to edit less, so I would really appreciate it if you sent me an, an Instagram message or uh, emailed me and said, hey, you know, we like this or we don't like this, do the other shit. Um, and also send your questions here. And if you have, you know, you can hop on with me. Uh, and we can discuss your training if you want to, uh, or your injuries or whatever. So thank you guys for watching. Uh, it's, I can't tell you how much I enjoy doing this and educating the combat sport community. So please continue to let me give you guys the information, but I do need direction from you because I need to know what you want. All right. Uh, it's been fun. I'll see you guys next time.